Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to deliver the presentation on the topic which is of particular importance for uh, me as a lawyer, but I hope also for you as uh, practicing lawyers and judges, because uh, to my deep perception, maybe the equality, equal pay cases will be the cases uh, which will be uh, which will be received by your uh, institutions because uh, the legal framework which is uh, in place in, uh, in uh, European Union legal uh, system as well as in our national systems is very extensive and very, I would say, also intensive. Uh, I would say that the most of the cases what uh, are possible to bring uh, to your courts, to our courts, are the cases related to equal pay for men and women. And I will tell you uh, why. But first of all, it's also rather interesting to be here and to represent the uh, Lithuania, the new member state. Uh, the state, uh, where just as other member states who joined recently, well, not recently, 14 years ago, European Union, uh, are still the states from uh, belonging to the post-Soviet, post-Soviet, uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, countries. In those countries, we had the main problem. Uh, I would say that we. Uh, were all equal, uh, all equal under the law. So basically, it was even unthinkable to have the situation when the state, the state institution, or the employer, which is, was basically the state employer, could uh, infringe, infringe the rights uh, of women, for instance, or uh, other minorities, because under the constitution, under the law, uh, there was a full equality and uh, discrimination was even unthinkable. But of course, membership in the European Union brings, uh, brings more, a lot of novelties, and not our national perception, the perceptions of uh, national courts, uh, it could be the Constitutional Court, or it could be the Supreme Court, will be designing the, the outcomes of possible litigations, because European Court of Justice and European legislator has put on, in place a uh, very, very uh, intensive legal framework how to cope with the uh, wage disparities where, when it concerns the gender discrimination. So let's uh, allow me, uh, please allow me to start with some definitions uh, for the sake of clarity. Uh, if we refer to the gender pay gap, we understand this is difference between average pay level of male and female employees. And what we have to take, we have to take the payment of, of men and payment of, uh, to payment of women, and, uh, and uh, we will be having, uh, we'll be able to calculate this difference. And there are some uh, discrepancies as far as, the, as far as the definition is concerned. For instance, uh, statisticians, they take one approach, the uh, European Commission may take another approach, slightly different approach. Those technicalities are maybe not of our concern, but what we uh, can now assume that we will be dealing with difference of payments for men and women. But what is more important as far as definitions uh, are concerned, those differences between notions of unadjusted pay gap and adjusted pay gap. Unadjusted or, uh, or absolute pay gap, the raw pay gap, this is uh, the statistical numbers, the figures of the data, which shows that the men earn more than the women. If we uh, refer to adjusted pay gap, we refer to the outcome of more sophisticated calculations where the objective criteria were already taken into account. Objective criteria which could uh, justify some differences in payments. So adjusted pay gap means, uh, uh, means that object, by taking into account objective criteria, we were able to diminish the d difference of payment uh, and to receive a more, let's say, objectified 
more objective, uh, more objective uh, uh, calculation. So just adjusted pay gap means the pay uh, adjusted according to individual characteristics that may explain part of the differences in earnings. Um, uh, please uh, take a look at uh, the data provided by the European Commission uh, and Eurostat. Uh, the, uh, the table is rather interesting. If you take a look at the countries where the pay gap is uh, the smallest one, where the, wide, uh, the smallest one, you will see such countries as Malta, Poland, and Italy. Uh, and Slovenia leading, uh, which could I indicate at the first glance that uh, there is a lot of equality over there. But if you take the countries on the right side, you will see Germany, Austria, and Estonia, especially the Nordic countries or countries, uh, countries such as Germany and Austria, where the pay gap is such a huge compared to the South Catholic countries. Uh, and uh, please don't be Please don't be scared, and, but please don't so be naive to think that the pay gap looks like this in practical, in practical terms. Uh, I very like very much uh, the table uh, number three this is on, on your slides as well. This is the composition of the unadjusted pay gap in 2014. Very, very nice survey done by, uh, done by uh, colleagues uh, Letien and Ronkowski, uh, which shows a totally different picture if we take into account the objective criteria and uh, we are able to assess the impact of those objective criteria, I will, take, I will talk about it later a bit, you will see that the unexplained or unadjusted, or unexplained adjusted pay gap could be totally different for each of the country. Uh, and, for instance, if you take the country like uh, Lithuania with uh, raw pay gap 13%, if you apply the uh, different instruments by taking out, taking out objective, uh, objective uh, justified factors, you will see that in the true pay gap is much bigger. Uh, we are leading here, I think, 24% of pay gap whereas uh, in the statistical data shows only 13%. And vice versa, if you take, for instance, Estonia with 28% of unadjusted pay gap, adjusted pay gap is only 20%. So uh, age, occupation, education, job, job experience, uh, working time pattern can be taken into account and after difficult, uh, difficult and sophisticated calculations, we can take out some of the parts of the differences in payments, but at the end, there are some gaps which cannot be explained. Uh, income disparity, an explanation of in income disparity could be very, uh, could be very uh, different. For instance, of course, we can take into account the age of the person, of professional experience, education, and career choices when we are uh, assessing uh, the earnings of this, of this particular persons. Of course, we can take into account the differences in financing of private and public sectors. In private sectors, uh, differences between men and between uh, uh, earnings of male and, and female workers are greater than in public sectors, but in public sectors, people are paid uh, in most of the countries less than in private sectors. If uh, we take a look at the work pattern, for instance, part-time work, uh, then we will see that, of course, part-time workers, they receive lower wages. This, is, this can be explained by the number, by taking into account the number of hours they are working, but if we take into account that mostly women are working part-time because they take most of the fam family responsibilities because of those family choices, then we will see that this also works out on the, on the statistics uh, how, much, uh, how much women receive in pay. Uh, the horizontal uh, segregation, gender segregation, uh, concerns the concentration of one sex in certain economic activities. 
For instance, if we take healthcare, if we take education, public administration, those sectors are heavily, uh, heavily, uh, they, they employ heavily women, and uh, those sectors where the earnings are much higher, for instance, finance sector, sector of insurance, we have much, uh, much more men employed here. So basically, if you take the managers and if you take cashiers, you will see that 79% of cashiers are females, uh, but 80% of executives are male. So this uh, occupational segregation is also uh, contributing uh, heavily to differences in uh, payment. Um, as I told you, some, pay, some, uh, some uh, differences can be explained, but some differences cannot be uh, explained and they constitute uh, they constitute basically uh, what we call uh, what we call sex discrimination. Uh, sex discrimination can be explained uh, well, maybe philosophically, uh, by using uh, notions of stereotypes, uh, devaluation of female work, uh, discrimination of uh, female uh, workers, and. Uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these stereotypes uh, or the other factors, uh, they, uh, I would say, have major impact on differences in some countries and in some uh, professions and some, some uh, areas. But today uh, we have to talk about, we have to talk about legal responses to this uh, social, economic, and legal problem. And, uh, Today we have to also differentiate between what is the law, what law can do, and what the policies and politics can do, Economist, economics what they can do, and what is the level of response here. Well, at the global level, let's start from the major international organizations. We have some instruments indicated on your slides. Uh, if we take a look at uh, International Labour Organization, we will find, of course, uh, quite many documents, but the most uh, important one is the Equal Remuneration Convention from the year 1951. United Nations also not, uh, not should be left at, uh, uh, outside. They have a convention on elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. But you now, with those international documents, we have always the problem of direct effect and direct application in national courts and those international instruments, they have own, own uh, system of supervision, uh, monitoring and implementation. Uh, therefore, you will not necessarily receive the case uh, based on those international documents. Uh, a slightly, slightly different situation is if we approach the regional level, the Council of Europe documents. We have here European Convention on Human Rights, uh, European Social Charter. And, um, for instance, social charter is also uh, dealing, dealing, to, dealing with, uh, dealing with uh, gender the discrimination issues. We have Article 20 of the charter, but also Article E, which has horizontal uh, meaning uh, in the charter where the discrimination of, uh, on the basis, on the grounds of, of gender is prohibited. And we have, the, we have the system of supervision and monitoring and uh, implementation of uh, this provision. Uh, European Convention on Human Rights, uh, you, you, know, you know this document for sure, uh, but here we don't have di directly or expressly uh, express this verbis provision on gender discrimination, on discrimination as such, because Article 14 has a different meaning. It has horizontal also impact on all the rights enshrined in the, in the convention, but not addressing directly sex discrimination or uh, the principle of equal pay uh, for, male, for men and women. Um, interesting to see what could be the responses at the national level, how the countries member states are coping with the problem of difference in payments. For instance, uh, maybe you have heard in, in UK, they introduced just recently legislation which uh, requires all the, all the employers employing more than 250 employees to uh, generate uh, 
the gender pay gap data and to make it available for the public authorities and for the publics. Uh, uh, one of the recent and most, uh, most uh, let's say, controversial uh, examples of the domestic, uh, uh, of domestic uh, policies uh, approaching uh, gender pay gaps is the reform in Iceland, 2017, when they imposed the full mandatory pay equality certification system, meaning that all establishments uh, employing more than 25 employees have to, uh, have to be certified whether they pay equally for men and, and women. And by, uh, by making this uh, system, um, by making the system compulsory and by having the system of sanctions for not complying with these administrative requirements, you can probably find a way how to make employers and employees also think whether they're paying fairly for, for, for the job. Uh, in my country, in Lithuania, with the new legislation, with the labor, law, uh, labor code, we introduced two novelties which basically directly address the pay gap issue. The first one is a simple provision that the works council uh, in the company should receive, should receive the average, uh, uh, should receive the data on the average uh, remuneration of men and women, uh, break down by the profession. I mean, uh, there was a plenty of questions why, why we should have this information as, as such, because it leads to nowhere, but we uh, think that this is very important information. If you know that the salaries of women and men are different in one particular profession or in sector in your company, that maybe this is for employees' representatives or the works councils to start, with, to, start to think whether this is the problem or not. So basically not the uh, legislator and not the court, not the law enforcement agency starting to, to, to be uh, concerned uh, about this issue, but basically employees representatives start to show some interest. And the second step, the second uh, provision which, ought, uh, which also addresses this issue is the compulsory pay, or pay or remuneration schemes. I mean, every employer has a remuneration scheme. In some countries, like in uh, Western Europe, the pay remuneration, pay and remuneration schemes are very transparent. They are, in some countries, they are, all, uh, they are inserted in the collective bargaining agreement or in, in the, let's say, degrees, resolutions of the government level, ministries, etc. So basically, the system is very transparent. In Eastern Bloc, in Eastern Europe, I would say the situation is quite different. We have very flexible remuneration system, which means, uh, which means that we pay as much as we want or we can. And in those systems, uh, the discriminations, uh, discrimination uh, occur very often. And to cope with this discrimination, we have at least to have remuneration systems based on a fairly, uh, fairly assessment criteria. Therefore, therefore, two, two requirements. First of all, to have, the, to have the data on the wage differences for men and women. On the second hand, to have a remuneration system, compulsory, leads to, I would say, more transparency and possible, and possible improvement of situation in uh, practice. Uh, now we uh, go to uh, European Union. Uh, European Union and uh, European uh, legislators and case law, legislators' responses and the case law observations. Well, um, you probably know that um, Article 119 was inserted in the treaty, in the Rome Treaty already in 1957, um, and uh, it has, at that time, it had very clear economic aim. Um, basically, the countries, the countries, and in this, in this regard, the France was insisting on inserting the Article 119 in the treaty, but uh, the ob observations or considerations uh, of the France was uh, purely eco of economic nature. Because of other countries were not having this principle, equal pay for men and women, France felt under the threat or under the danger that the 
work of women will be used uh, in uh, will be used uh, for other countries to be more competitive uh, than the other. Uh, this uh, interstate competition link co uh, clause very quickly lost its primary meaning uh, with the new legislation at European Union level and especially with the case law European Court of Justice. But just to show you the, the evolution of this notion of this uh, principle from Article 119, uh, it basically was not changed until the Maastricht Treaty where we, s we, can, we can see already that the principle of equal pay for male and uh, for male and female workers was extended to, uh, to, was extended to also encompass uh, work of equal value. Uh, we have a evolution at the level of primary legislation. But the, I would say the most important evolution was brought, or even sometimes we can call it a revolution, was brought by European uh, Court of Justice of that time, now uh, Court of Justice of European Union. It uh, gave very extensive and intensive interpretation to the Article 119. Today, the Article uh, 157 of the treaty. Uh, direct effect of the provision uh, of 119 uh, was, uh, was introduced uh, for the first time in labor legislation as such, but also uh, as far as we, the treaty is concerned uh, for, for other areas uh, uh, covered by the EU legislation. Secondly, direct horizontal effect, which is also very important bec be because we deal here uh, with the private employees. And if you take a look at the Article 119, uh, how it is uh, composed today, each member state shall ensure uh, direct horizontal effect means not a member state shall ensure. Direct horizontal effect has the meaning that each employer in the member state shall ensure. This is interpretation given by the Court of Justice of this provision. And uh, this is actually also some, some academics uh, claim that this is interpretational contra legem. The treaty imposed obligation on the member state but not on the private employer. The Court of Justice made it compulsory for the private employer by saying that this is the principle, this is so crucial, this is so important that we cannot leave it only to the member states be bound by this uh, provision. And so, slowly but surely the principle has gained more importance, not only political, but also the legal importance because uh, the court and then uh, later on the legislator uh, legislators uh, have, have leveled up the, the ranking of, of, of this provision by stating that this is also, this, uh, this is also could be uh, regarded as a principle of EU legal system. So in different case, you can see that the, uh, the court is directly saying this, equal pay for male and female workers for equal work principle forms a part of the foundation of European Community and basically, this uh, gave a impetus. This gave a big stimulus to further develop the anti-discrimination legislation. So, from the principle equal pay for men and women, we receive the principle non-discrimination based on gender. Then we receive the principle. Uh, we receive ex extensive extensive formulation of the principle, non-discrimination based on other grounds. And you learned about the European Directive from the year 2000, which addresses other grounds of prohibited discrimination. And then we also covering other areas, not only the payment, but also the, the, the areas such as occupation, uh, working conditions, et, uh, et cetera. And uh, in different two already, the court has recognized that the provision has not only economic, but also social importance, double purpose, and slowly but surely we are developing further. In Sievers and Schrage, he says the principle is already social, not economic principle, which means that we are not anymore stick to the economic aims of initial provision of uh, Article 119.
uh, at the level of secondary, at the level of uh, secondary legislation, we uh, received a directive from the year 75-117 on the approximation of the laws of the member states on the application of the principle. Uh, to today, this directive uh, was uh, uh, was. Uh, amended or was abolished and the new directive, recast directive is in force, uh, the directive 2006-54-EC uh, uh, reiterating the provisions of the case law, but also the provisions of the former directive. What is interrelationship, uh, we'll be talking a little bit later because between those two different types of instrument, but today, and we can uh, surely say that a provision of Article 119, today 157 of the treaty, um, has a lot of positive impulses on EU uh, legal uh, system. For instance, it ranks as a fundamental right. It is also recognized among the new fundamental rights uh, by, uh, by Court of Justice, but also in the Charter of Fundamental Rights from the year 2000. And uh, we have also secondary legislation on equality, uh, which were inspired by the successes of the Article 119. So the Directive 2078, 2043, they bring us more, more room to, 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 to create uh, non-discrimination policy uh, in European uh, Union. Uh, today, we have basically two different provisions dealing with the same problem, an equal pay problem. Article 157 of the treaty and Directive 2006-54. And uh, you can see that uh, there are slight differences. There are slight differences in how much detailed is the primary legislation in some aspect compared to the secondary legislation directive. Um, but, you know, um, those differences are having not so much implications on the argumentations of the court and also for the case law of domestic. Uh, of domestic uh, courts, because as in Jenkins said, directive does not add something substantial to the treaty. The court means that the principle which is, which is uh, laid down in the treaty as such is sufficient clear. It is sufficient uh, detailed to, uh, to oblige the employers to act in one way which is not discriminatory. So directive as such gives no much more but just repeats the principle. As far as we, but this is only uh, valid for workers and remuneration. If we step from this area to, to cover very specific areas such, a, such, a, such as pensions, such as self-employed, then the directive starts to play a major role. Therefore, we have to know the limits of uh, the Article 157. So if we deconstruct the principle which uh, is set, which, uh, lays, uh, which is laid down in the treaty in Article 157, okay, who are the addressees of the, of the provision? Equal pay for men and women. Member states only? Yes, of course, legislator. Yes, of course, governments. But also other creators of normative acts. The, the rationale of the court is quite simple. If the law, if the member state distributes the normative power to other actors, such as social partners, then the state is also shall oblige the social partners to act in non-discriminatory way. Meaning that if somebody has normative power to act, this power comes from the state, 
because it's sanctioned by the state, these actors should also be bound by the principle. In other words, if the social partners have a power to legislate, to create collective barring agreements, and which have normative effect, social partners are bound by the principle. If the employer has power to create normative acts, as it is the case in some countries, then the employer is also bound by this principle because this legislative power is sanctioned by the state. So, employer also, yes. And then we have, as I told you, direct effect, vertical and direct horizontal effect, meaning that the private employers are also bound by this, by this uh, provision. Uh, Article 4 of the directive also, also mentions workers, also mentions, mentions uh, employees, and here uh, we have address, address uh, the question who, is, who falls under the scope of application of this provision. So uh, we know that the workers should be, shall be covered. And here, uh, if you as the lawyers and the, the judges um, facing piece of legislation, provisions, contracts, agreements, which, have, which define the scope of application as a worker or employee, we have, very, uh, we have in the European labor law a very crucial problem who is covered in terms of national law. Domestic legal systems, national laws can assess very different, different categories of men and women working. In other words, some people in some countries can be seen as employees, some not. For instance, in the UK, they have a notion of worker, which is not employee. In some countries, they have a notion of parasubordinati, or economically dependent workers, which are not employees. So basically, national law, member state, can very differently, very differently distinguish employees and workers. And for, this, and for, the, for the implementation of the principle of equal pay, this can constitute the real problem. Then in different member states, we will have different application and implementation. And uh, very soon the Court of Justice uh, underlines that the concept, underlined that the concept of workers should have community meaning. It cannot be defined by reference to the legislation of the member states, which means that if the worker, if the notion of workers, worker is referred to in the Article 157, then this notion should be the same, and definition should be the same for all member states. And he also makes a reference to the very famous case of Larry Bloom, free movement of workers, and takes out of this case three principles, three principles which define the worker. The worker is the person who, for a certain period of time, performs the services and under the direction of another person in return. Of, for which he received remuneration. Three criteria, remuneration, services, subordination. Basically, every country has those criteria in place when they define employee. But what is here important, we cannot simply by saying some people are public servants, they are not employees, diminish or uh, limit the scope of application. So what we w I wanted to stress that the concept of worker has uh, the community meaning and it has strong parallel to the concept based uh, on the case law in the area of free movement of workers. Employees, yes, they fall under the, 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 the scope of application of the equal pay principle. Trainees as well, uh, Lori Bloom case. Public servants, they fall under this notion. Uh, interesting. In the framework of free movement of workers, public servants are, have the exception. But they have exception not from the notion of worker. So the free movement rules do not apply to them, but they are still considered workers. 
Uh, therefore, public servants, including armed military forces, they fall under the, the, the notion. Uh, Quasi-employees, the employees which are, I would say, self-employed. Uh, this is uh, also a tricky question, and uh, if we, under today, uh, general perception, they definitely not falling under the directive, under the Article 157, because self-employed people and employed people, uh, they are clearly divided today in the case law and in the legislation of the European Union, but uh, please be careful with this, uh, with this distinction, because the Directive 2006-54 makes reference to the self-employed people uh, by saying, in some aspects, the self-employed are covered by the non-discrimination rules, as far as access to employment is concerned, for instance, or uh, occupational pension schemes are concerned. Um, territorial scope of application. I would say that the principle of equal pay belongs to the hard provisions of the European Union law, also to the hard provisions of the domestic law, and uh, it will be working as overriding or mandatory provision regardless applicable law uh, which could be chosen by the parties. So uh, if you are judge in European Union court, if you are dealing with a different jurisdiction chosen by the parties, principle of equal pay work, will work either as a mandatory overriding provision of the Lex Loci Laboris or as a public order of the forum jurisdiction. So th this is, uh, this important was, was introduced uh, simply by the fact, uh, can be introduced simply by the fact that this is foundation of EU uh, legal uh, system. This principle belongs to this foundation. Uh, in the article 157, we also see the definition, we also see the reference to the pay. And the article 50, 157 itself provides for a pay definition. Uh, for the purpose of this article, pay means ordinary basic or minimum wage or salary or any other consideration, whether in cash or in kind, interestingly, which worker receives directly or indirectly in respect of his employment from his uh, employer. Payment or remuneration is understood by European Court of Justice very broadly. Why? Because this is the principle. Therefore, the exceptions should be interpreted in a narrow way. But let's take a look at the examples what kinds of considerations or remunerations uh, were considered as a pay in the case law of Court of Justice. Salary and supplements, yes, okay. Travel benefits for workers and family members. Payment of wage in the event of illness. In some countries, in some occupational, it is covered by occupation, occupational scheme or by social insurance. Continued payment, yes. Maternity benefit. Christmas bonus. Compensation for attendance and training courses of the staff councils and the works councils, for instance. Redundancy payment, the benefits. Survivor's pension based on collective bargaining agreement. Bridging allowances provided by works agreement. Company cars, company homes, shares, loans. We will go further. Stimulation and gratification for loyalty. Future performance. The court says yes. The fact that certain benefits are paid after the termination of the employment relationship does not prevent them from being in the nature of pay, says court in the case Barber. Uh, what, we sh should, what we should know here that as far as a directive is concerned, directive 
prohibits discrimination in general in working conditions. Let's say access to employment, execution of the contract, and termination of the contract. So remuneration is one of the single working conditions. And only remuneration is covered by the primary legislation. Whereas other working conditions are not covered by the principle which is in the treaty, but covered by the directive. Why I'm stressing this? Because of direct effect. Directive has no direct effect in general, but the treaty on function of European Union has a direct effect. And if we face equal pay discrimination, we can rely on Article 200, 157. And if it is not remuneration, in the case of discrimination based on sex, this is, for instance, for instance, classification issue. For instance, employee, employee argues that the employer has wrongfully put him under the classification scheme under one level or second level or third level. So you understand, what is the issue in the dispute? The dispute concerns the classification of employee in that or that or that level. In fact, it, the salary of employee will be affected because you belong to different levels of payment. And court says, no, no, no. Classification of the employee is a working condition. This is not the payment directly. This is not payment. And therefore, classification is not covered by the treaty, but covered by the directive. This is very important difference when we address issues related to, related to, 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 to pay. What can be seen as a pay, what can be seen, what could not be seen as a pay, because it has uh, direct implications on which norms we will be using. Either primary law will be affected and will be having possibility to apply the principle 157 of the treaty directly, or the directive will be affected. Then we have a problem because then we will be facing the such implications as whether directive has a direct effect in vis-a-vis uh, -vis private employer. And then, of course, those non-discrimination provisions, basically all of them have self-executing self -executing effect. They will be all directly applicable, but who is the respondent? If the respondent is private employer, we cannot force him to, to obey the, the provision of the directive, which is not implemented or, or wrongfully transposed in international legislation. <coughs> Uh, the pension problem, pension benefits, is also the problem because, you know, the pension is not, in many jurisdictions, pension is not considered as a pay as such. Uh, and here we have to distinguish between state social insurance benefits and private or occupational schemes benefit. So the state social insurance benefit has a separate special exception in the Directive 79-7. They are not covered by the gender discrimination, prohibition of gender discrimination clause. But if we take into account the occupational pension schemes, they are covered by the principle of equal treatment. Why? Because they are considered pay. And uh, there is a long list of the cases examined by the Court of Justice where, where the Court of Justice reiterates its position, occupational pension scheme is, in fact, uh, pay. And uh, if you would like to be more familiar with the uh, principle of non-discrimination and application of this principle in occupational social security schemes, uh, just take a look at the Article 5, or 6, 8, and 9 of the directive. Directive provides 
for examples of discrimination defines the personal uh, scope, material scope of this provision, how it uh, should be constructed at the national level. Uh, I refer now to the principle of non-discrimination equal treatment. Uh, if we say there should be no discrimination based on sex in the area of, uh, of non-discrimination, in the area uh, of uh, remuneration, we also, we also think and construct the, 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 our principle that unequal treatment should be abolished, should be eliminated. There should be no discrimination. And the uh, Court of Justice is also cons may makes, uh, makes some important observations giving us the first, very first impetus how we should evaluate the situations. First of all, let's say, what is comparable should be treated equally. What is not comparable should be treated differently. This is the general observation when it uh, faces the cases of discrimination. But what we face in the practical life is whether the employer pays fair wages. And here in Gillespie, for, in for instance, the court says, no, no, no. The fair remuneration is not the concern of the court, is not the concern of European legislator. So equal inequality in treatment, but not the fair remuneration is required by the treaty. But then we, call, we go to the, uh, to the principle, uh, application of the principle, to the work of work which is equal of men and women or has equal uh, value. Um, for instance, for, first of all, we have to adjust the principle to the practical, factual situations. Equal work is required by men and women in order to have equal, in order to, to, to oblige employer pay equal wages. So equal work requires equality in work what, is, what should, should this, this mean? It is like work or work rated as equivalent work. Like work involves similar tasks which requires similar skills and differences are not of practical importance. Like work, work could be rated as equivalent where under fair remuneration system the work equal, has equal value in terms how demanding it is. I'm citing here UK legislative, legislative approach when they distinguish equal work and work voted as equivalent. But to this, we have also third notion of equal value work given by Court of Justice and later on inserted into the treaty. Work of equal value, work that might appear to be different, but if the high demands are made on work criteria, such as knowledge of skills, efforts and stress, responsibility, conditions in the work environment. And here, my dear colleagues, we are not willing to find equal value of two works, of two different work performances. To my perception, what court wants us to say and why we need this concept to say that, simply to say that lower value work cannot be paid more low, cannot be paid more compared to the work of higher value and here if you take for instance storage worker 
and storage worker and specialist accountant uh, textile industry workers drivers driver specialist storage worker specialist in some industries those storage workers are men basically in, so, in some industries those specialists are women work of the women is not the same but it has more value it is not equivalent it is not likewise it has more value but totally different and what courts want to say that this principle of equal value gives possibility to prohibit this kind of payment and uh, equal value work was was uh, the, the principle addressing equal value work was inserted into the treaty into the treaty just uh, recently by Amsterdam treaty but it has the major aim to address those inequalities of treatment when we based on stereotypes basically are paying for work which is performed by the women lower wages compared to this low skills work performed basically by men uh, in all those scenarios we of course need comparator we cannot say that somebody is earning more than somebody without having the person we are able to compare it to you and the court of justice also creating some framework uh, who can be compare comparator uh, we can address simple individual by saying we compare the work of the victim of alleged discrimination to work of individual person or we can compare also group with a group uh, the activities performed the activities could be performed at different time frames they do not shall not necessarily be performed in the same time comparison with activity of a lower value is also possible here we have a link to the equal uh, value uh, cases and not necessarily the same employer but the same source and we mean here a sectoral for instance or national wide collective bargaining agreement doctrine of the same source if the source is paying I mean if we have inequality issues basically inequality issues are issues are issues appearing in the same company by the same employer so who is the who is the bad guy paying the wrong wages this is employer bad guy but if employer is bound by the collective bargaining agreement and he cannot deviate from this agreement so the source is providing for inequalities despite the fact that the employers are uh, different different here uh, by cho if uh, we choose comparator burden of proof of course goes on employer and here what we practically use we you shall use uh, statistics uh, and uh, proportion of men in the workforce should be compared to the pro proportion of female workers in this uh, stuff and uh, by uh, using the statistics we can assess the assess the actual implication of uh, implications of uh, differences in treatment and a uh, few last I uh, so know we approaching we approaching now the break and then questions uh, few slides also on what you know already as far as the forms of discrimination is concerned direct discrimination and indirect discrimination those two forms of discrimination are also uh, are also um, can be found in in, in uh, cases related to equal pay uh, and uh, cases of direct discriminations are quite obvious one once so when we on the factor of, of, of gender we can find that the different treatment is based only on, on this factor uh, justification is not allowed 
Uh, this is also something you, you already know from the general observations on, on, uh, on, say, on discrimi discrimination law. But what we can find sometimes when the court has, the court is facing situations where the difference of, t of treatment is exactly based directly on the sex. And in this case, as he tries not to look for justifications, basically, by not willing not to step out from, from this general path, but, but says that the situations are not comparable, uh, not comparable uh, in, in fact, and therefore the justification is not needed. Indirect discrimination is more um, difficult construction here because we have the, the, the differentiation of the remuneration which is not directly based on the, on the sex or, or gender. And the most, uh, obvious, uh, most obvious cases are related to the part-time work uh, and differentiation uh, uh, on the ground of the length of service. And you know, if you take, for instance, uh, this length of service of female workers with a lot of interruptions based on, on family uh, responsibilities, uh, problems with the vocational training and qualification and skills, etc., you can see that from, from all those factors, we can, we can gather the uh, negative effect on the negative effect on qualification, but also on the length of service of, of, of female workers, which then afterwards will affect the grade, the salary, uh, the promotion, uh, uh, etc. Therefore, uh, therefore, indirect discrimination is also one of the, one of the crucial, crucial uh, uh, aspects we have to take into account when we are dealing with the cases. And uh, after the break, we'll be having this practical, practical case uh, solution possibility as well. And uh, justifications of uh, di indirect discrimination are always are, are also the same, as uh, you know already. Objective explanations, uh, three step, uh, three step rules. First of all, the aim should be, uh, the aim should be uh, the positive one. Uh, we can justify unequal treatment which occurs indirectly by having the rule which tries to make the positive impact in company, in the labor market, or somewhere else. This is the positive aim. Then we are, the second aspect of, of, of this uh, concept, we look whether this measure, which is implied by the legislator or by the employer, is appropriate to achieve the positive aim, and thirdly, whether the measure is proportionate. So the aim, appropriateness of the measure, and proportionality, this test, three-step test, uh, could be implied uh, here, and this is uh, also the, the, the principles provided by the case law of Court of Justice and also by the uh, directive. And the last slide on the remedies. Yes, burden of proof goes on the employer. Uh, always we have possibility to compensate non-material damages, which has no limits. And if we are facing the problem whether we should diminish the salary of the male worker or increase the salary, in our judgment, to the Female worker, the principle of leveling up should be applied, which means we will not diminish the salary of the male worker. We simply level up the, or raise the salary of the female worker. So thank you very much for your attention and be looking to answer your questions. Thank you.